So we're delighted to have Helen Lewis with us today, who I will hold up a copy, but it's back to front of her book. <laughs> so you're, <laughs> you're holding up as well over there. So um, we haven't really set any kind of structure for today other than we will talk about the book. So um, Helen, I don't know if you want to talk about why you wrote the book, although it is pretty well detailed um, in it. So, and then perhaps um, those that have written the book can chat about it. Shirley, you're like rocking around everywhere. <laughs> Oh, don't. I'm in a mare. I've got children that have oh, been put to bed and trying to come into my room. <laughs> They're welcome to listen. So, Helen, if you could just tell us a bit about a little bit about why you read the book. I think we've all got a pretty idea about it. And then we'll, we'll talk about kind of what the book meant to us and our kind of ideas. Sure. I mean, I started writing it in 2017, actually, the um, October of that year. And I remember thinking that I just, oh, Shirley, would you mind muting yourself? Because otherwise, yeah, I'm gonna, so. <laughs> otherwise I'm going to get thrown off course. Um, and, and, and I just, you know, and I, I felt pretty depressed about politics, actually, uh, at the time for, you know, it was the aftermath, a year after the election of Donald Trump, a year after that really nasty Brexit campaign, and then that very strange 2017 election. Um, and I kind of felt slightly dispirited about everything. So it was a real tonic to me in terms of um, my kind of feelings about politics, actually, in my sort of own mental state, because there's no kind of cure really for um, that level of ennui, quite like looking at the history of the feminist movement, which has just done an extraordinary amount in 150 years, so much so quickly that I think we often take it for granted. Um, and it really re-energised me, and particularly the bit I write about in, a, in the final chapter about going to Ireland for that repeal the eighth referendum. That to me was the beginning of the tide kind of turning slightly back again. Um, and, and saying, you know, maybe actually we've, like the whatever you want to call it, the liberal left um, progressives have had it slightly too easy and we've lost our kind of campaigning muscles. We've lost the idea that you actually have to fight for everything. But when you get a group of uh, incredible campaigners like Repeal the Eighth. Actually, you know, we can still make really big progress. And I, and I think that's been something that's been borne out ever since. I've just written the update for the paperback chapter, you know, which has got the fact that finally next year we have no fault divorce coming through. Um, and that was actually surprising to me. You know, there wasn't even a division on one of, um, one of the readings of that because the support for it was just so overwhelming. So after years and years of being, you know, thinking that we were in this terrible culture war that we were going to drift into in a kind of US style culture war where the right, you know, the religious right was going to start sort of talking about saving traditional families. Actually, with the exception of Fiona Bruce, who reliably gets involved in such things, even the right of the Conservative Party saw the logic of the fact that the current system was just really punishing people and particularly hard on women. Um, so that, you know, that gave me hope. Repeal the Eighth gave me hope. Um, and the extension of abortion rights then to Northern Ireland, which was done through either, you know, you can call it parliamentary chicanery if you want, but just smart politics, really, from, from committed campaigners. So all of that, yeah, all of that just sort of cheered me up by the end. May I ask um, how you decided to, what you decided to write on and how you sort of decided the chapters? Were they quite obvious to you or did you spend a bit of time? I don't think they were obvious to me, actually. And, and some of them developed. I, I sent it out to a friend to read after writing the first draft. And his feedback was I had a chapter that was called then Leisure. And he was like, you've mushed together two different things here, one of which is female sports and one of which is, you know, female unpaid caring labour. And those are two different things. So I hacked them apart into the time chapter and the play chapter because they were really very different subjects. Um, so, you know, it was a constant process like that all the way through. The love chapter, you know, my initial nomination for a for lesbian hit heroine um, was Anne Lister, who then went on to, you know, the brilliant Sally Wainwright series was made about. But when I started thinking about her, I thought, actually, you know what, she's not a good fit for this book, because although she was a pioneer in just terms of deciding to live her life, you know, the way she really wanted to against society's expectations. She didn't campaign to change the law. And that to me, and you know, she was actually pretty small C conservative. She just happened to be a lesbian. Um, and that to me was a difference between that and the women that I found in my books is, is that in the ones I, what I wanted to write about really was the process of how you make change happen, how you form a campaign, you know, what alliances you have to make, what are the necessary preconditions for victory, all of that stuff. So it, it emerged quite organically. You know, I had thought there were various things that I knew I definitely wanted. I knew I definitely wanted to tell the story of Erin Pitsy because I just find it so fascinating that you go, you know, people making such political 180 as it looked to me from the outside, um, going from founding a women's refuge to being a men's rights activist. I knew that I wanted to tell a story that was about um, 
it was about a minority woman that was about the kind of double bind of, of race uh, and sex. Uh, so I was very, very happy to find the story of Jeb and the site. And that also gave me an excuse to write a bit about um, trade unions and, uh, you know, and, and organised labour, which is not something that I really knew about before. And then, yeah, sport was kind of fascinating to me because I just absolutely no knowledge of it to start with. So I, I, I went from, you know, naught to 60 on that one. Definitely. I mean, there's so much I could say from just what you've just said there. I mean, I should plug also that me and Kelly are arranging a Women in History event series with Jaya Bindas I as well as one of our um, women in that. So I'm really looking forward to that. And that should hopefully be early next year. Um, for people like myself outside of the book, the book writing world, what are the sort of timescales that that you you sort of came across with this book? So you started writing it in October. You, you had your first draft in October 2017, did you say? Yeah, and if any of you are thinking of writing a book, it's, it's it's worth thinking about how long you can leave yourself to do it, particularly if you're doing it around another job, as as I was, actually. So um, th it had all started with a publisher had asked me to do kind of a history of feminism in 100 objects, you know, like the British Museum's um, History of the World, or do it in places. And then they came back to me and said, OK, we want 50,000 words and we want it in six months. Uh, and I went, uh, you're having a laugh, aren't you? Um, and my agent sort of broadly said, they're having a laugh, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and and he said, you know, take a proper, do a proper eighty thousand words is a standard kind of um, hardback format book, and and take a properly like two years to do it in. As it happens, I it took slightly less than that. I started October twenty seventeen. I handed in my first draft three days early, which my editor said had never happened before in January twenty nineteen, and then it came back for a second draft, which ended up going back to them in the summer of twenty nineteen. They then took a luxuriously long amount of time to kind of do marketing on it and and that was I mean that bit's the like the fun bit that's the bit that you hang on for because it's all like you're looking at sort of swatches of cover designs and colors mm -hmm. and like um I loved doing all that stuff because it was like I'm a proper author I'm a proper <laughs> author whereas all the bit when you sit at home in your house you know day after day after day writing at a keyboard doesn't feel like being a proper author it feels like being a terrible author who's failing at everything um but for the majority of that time I was uh, I went down to part-time at the New Statesman where I was so it was a big old juggling act. And, you know, I don't have kids, so I'm in, I was in a fortunate position of that. I was only juggling the book writing with, with paid work. But it was something that um, just made me very aware all the way through it, of writing about the fact that women's activism has been so much constrained by women's time and women's duties in the home. And that I really wanted to represent that in the book. There's one thing I've been wanting to ask is the last week particularly. It, it struck me when I hit the, read the book that one of the things that really, um, really resonated with me and that I've been reflecting a lot on since is this kind of idea we have of, of sort of sainted women and often um, you can mention almost any any woman in the public eye to somebody and so I really admire her for that and they'll say but what about what she did with X is kind of this idea of pure heroines and it struck me a lot of things that you spoke about during the book but particularly the last week since Mary Stopes Clinic have changed their name to um, MSI I believe mm. um, and um you know, I saw some sort of comment on social media about Mary Stropes, particularly about what a sort of terrible person she was. And I tried to engage a couple of people in a discussion about, um, you know, could, could we balance out the right she did with, with the wrong she's done? And can we look at it in other kind of kind of ways? And I just wondered in, in light of Mary Stropes clinics cha changing their name, um, if you had any kind of thoughts on that or if any indeed if anyone else did. Well, I'll tell you my tuppence worth of it, which is we've got into this weird thing where we think that history is the, the point of history is celebration. I don't really know where that came from. Um, the, the idea that it's all about memorialising people or championing people. And I think that's, you know, the bit that I take aim of in the first introduction to the book, which is the You Go Girl inspiration industry. That's sort of become our primary method of telling history, women's history in particular, right? It's 50 awesome women and like great speeches from people who changed the world. And if the premise of that is you're going to read about people who will make your nine-year-old daughter want to go into STEM, there's not a lot of space in there to go, oh, P.S. racist. Mm. And, and that's a problem because that's not history at that point. That's a kind of weird, I don't know there's what, what, what word I would even call it, but it's, it's a sort of processed food version of history that's designed to be kind of swallowed in little gobbets. Um, and you're right, the Maristops is again an absolutely classic example. Of this. I mean, the, the Fabian Society is another example. You know, the, the webs were eugenicists and called it really very wrong on, on Soviet Russia as well you know what does it mean to have a society named in their honor what does it mean it's named in their honor or does it mean that it's named to commemorate a specific thing that they did and this is kind of part of the statue debate as well mm. um 
I mean, I kind of, I think probably on Mary Stopes, I would say sin bin her simply because she, I mean, there were other people doing it who she kind of crowded out. Um, that's, and again, this comes, comes back to another thing, which I'm writing about my new book, which is about genius and about, it's called The Selfish Genius. So it's about kind of individual achievement is the way that so much of this stuff is also about lauding one person as the person who was responsible for something. And we've written out Stella Brown, for example, we've written out Havelock Ellis, we've written out hordes of people who are equally responsible because Mary Stokes was a, among her other many achievements, a massive self-publicist. And actually, that's part of the reckoning, too, is that actually who put their name on stuff? You know, um, Francis Galton, whose name was has recently been taken off the lab at UCL, again, for eugenics reasons, he would just happen to be, you know, inherit some money. So he had enough money to spend his life being a gentleman scholar. And that meant that he had enough money to endow a chair. All of that's sort of deeply unfair in a way. And why does that get your name on a lecture theatre in perpetuity? Why is the things that people wanted to celebrate in 1904 the same things you want to celebrate now? And I, I, as long as we have that conversation in a grown-up way, not in a kind of culture war battlefield way, I think it's quite a useful and interesting conversation to have. I agree. I think I think that's a really good point about this kind of black and white culture war kind of kind of idea. As in, does anyone else want to chip in here? Just please, please just but button it or put your hands up or however you want to. However you want to contribute, you trying to speak. I'll say something. I'll just say that I think sometimes maybe this is, I don't know, I hate saying the word woke, but maybe this is the, I don't know. But there are some things to me that are a no-go sort of area. And if it is just a bit uncomfortable to celebrate someone who was just that, um, that unpalatable now, but that doesn't mean that you can, you can't separate from what they've that what they achieved in their time but I also think like the idea of the perfect woman is just so not it's just it's a really interesting point of the book that really really resonated with me I was thinking we really do heart like hold women to a higher standard than we do our male heroes and the fact that you know we have all these caveats you know she was great but she did this we don't do that with Churchill or any of the huge other well we're starting to now but we don't really do that in the same way as a society and I'd really I just would like to get your thoughts and you know like on contemporary narratives when it comes to women um there's always you know she's great but or she did this and it's never you can never just say oh she's really fabulous at her job um I don't know if that's just me but I sort of see it as a very different double standard that we hold women to they have to be absolutely perfect before we can sort of idolize them oh yeah no I think it's I think it's a fascinating model where it's it's a kind of how do I phrase this? It's a sort of version of the kind of one drop rule where one 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 bit of something that we, you don't like kind of colours everything else, um, which is not, you know, and, and I use that analogy carefully because it's a very inflammatory one, but it's the same um, classification system that is just so unbelievably rigidly binary. Is someone good? Yes, no. Is someone black, white? Yes, no. And, and that's not how life works. And it certainly shouldn't be how history works and the, but the question is whether or not it which is the right way around because we're always assumed like Deborah Cameron is very good on this that whatever kind of women are doing is wrong is is it wrong that we're having the conversation about the imperfections of women or is it wrong that we're not having enough of a conversation about the imperfections of men and I think what's fascinating to that is that you you are you know you run into people who will defend Winston Churchill and have no you know, no need, no sort of self-reflection about, about that fact that they're kind of a Winston Churchill fan. And you're kind of not allowed to be like a Mary Wollstonecraft fan in the, in the same way, right? Like there's a sort of thing about things that women like a, a lesser somehow, or that women should always constantly be apologizing for themselves. You know, I think that's a really big trope that I see online a lot. That if you are attacked as a woman online for a particular view that you hold, it is almost seen as a kind of injury that you don't instantly go, oh, I'm so sorry. Whereas I, I don't see men on Twitter when they're attacked for an opinion, their instant response is expected to be, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, and and it, it's, that, it's, it's that part of it is about, are women you know, allowed to take up space? And I, you know, I hate to see it when women do it to other women, you know, the idea that there's only one lady slot and it, like, if she's got it, I haven't got it. And so what we have to do is find the thing that means that she's not entitled to it so someone better can have it rather than saying, why is there only one women's slot? Like, why can't we ask for more? 
and it, it just it just seems like a classic way to narrow feminism down to turning it into a competition between women rather than something yeah. that's asking something of men yeah this is a little bit off topic but i really want to ask your opinion on the mary wellencraft statue well, well it, i wrote about it and and i think it's heinous but yeah. It's allowed to be, I'm allowed to think it's heinous and you're allowed to think it's brilliant. Like it's art, it's I fine. <laughs> no, I mean, maybe somewhere out there we'll find the mythical person who, who goes like, that was exactly how I would have represented Ross Royal Scruff. I can't believe she came up with something so perfect. But that's, you know, it's public art. It's, it's not there. Again, it's about like, what is it for? Is it a monument to her? Well, they've been very clear that it's, it's not. I think it's, I, what I, my problem with it is really, is that I can understand that they're trying to say something representational. What is it trying to represent? like what is what is the meaning of it like I could totally understand that you would do something that emphasized the fact that Mary Wollstonecraft and the vindication of rights women is the shoulders on which we're all standing you know something that would take it to an abstract plane but like I said it just looks like a barbie stuck to a melted ice dolly like I don't get anything from it apart from it's it's kind of penisy and it's also just weirdly underwhelming in that it just looks like the proportions of it just, it's got this sort of weird organic base, that, it's all sort of furry at the bottom, and then this sort of absurd shaft, and then the tiny little figure on the top is, is pathetic. And the proportions of it are the exact opposite of heroic, right? You know, all those sculptures, like Michelangelo's David has deliberately got big hands and big feet. Like they're not, all the proportions are not together. But the, what you see when you look at it is what looks like a portrait of idealized masculine strength. Well, that looks like to me to a portrait of dainty little female passivity. And you kind of go, like, what's Mary Wollstonecraft about that? Like, if you wanted to represent her as a wall of fire or something like that, you know, something incredible that was representation, I'd be well up for it. You don't know, not everything has to be a kind of bronze bust on a plinth or someone sitting on a bloody horse. But like, I just don't get it. But that's okay, it's art. It's not there to be, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not a consensus operation. I think for me, I feel so engaged by, um, by uh, the Millicent Fawcett statue. Like, I was so excited. And I do love that joke about why is she holding, holding a tea towel. But um, aside from that, it was so exciting then to see the new, the, the next statue along kind of thing. It's just another naked woman. It looks like a garden statue to me. I, I felt really disappointed. But the interesting thing about that is, so uh, my friend is Caroline Criado Paris was the driving force behind that. And she fought every step of the way, every, like every bit along that, for, for example, to have a statue of Millicent Fawcett. Um, saying, you know, one of the things is that there are so few statues of women that aren't, it's either they're queens or it's like the spirit of victory. I know I want a statue of a woman that we know who it is. And even so, they still slightly wimped out of it. And there's a whole load of people around the base. Mm -hmm. And you know, you just know, including some blokes, that you just know that was their attempt to offset the kind of, why are we honoring this woman? What about, what about the suffragettes? Mm -hmm. like the, and, and she had to put her foot down, which is one thing she's incredible at doing, in order to make sure that that was a statue of a particular person, rather than just having a statue to feminism. Mm. And then again, like in terms of getting the, the sculptor right, you know, being very insistent on wanting a female sculptor, but also someone who really got the project. And like you say, the tea towel, you know, that's a, a, an obvious echo of Gillian Waring's work about your signs that say what you want them to say, not what you don't want them to say, that, that this was also going to be something that was reflective of, of the artistic practice of the person doing it and was a tribute to the fact that we now have amazing female artists who can produce public monuments of this quality but yeah but in in other people's hands that could have been a disaster can i ask a question about that um about the committee that made the decision who made that decision about the statue well i mean this is all my i mean this is what i've read on the internet so i haven't this none of this made it into my piece this is not fact checked but as I understand it, they only had a, a, sm a small number of submissions of people who would do it for the money. And one was from a male sculptor, one was a female sculptor, Maggie Hambling. And they did, I think they didn't feel they could pick a, a male sculptor. Um, mm. But I also think they were overall by the fact that Maggie Hambling is a brilliant artist. Her portrait of Dorothy Hodgkin, I don't know if you've seen it, it's in the National Portrait Gallery, where um, the experimental chemist, where she's got like four hands to show how kind of constantly busy she was. It, it, you know, it's incredible. Um, so I think they were really happy to have that. And I, 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 my, my hunch is that no one went, no one wanted to be the Philistine who went, could it look like her? Could it look like her? Because that's the kind of thing that kind of reveals you to be a bit of a basic, isn't it? Like, I just want a nice statue of Mary Wollstonecraft. Like, I think there must have been a certain worry that that would out you as being someone who didn't kind of get it. 
But I feel really sorry for them. I mean, God knows they spent 10 years fundraising yeah. for it. <laughs> We've got and, the... I hate, and, you know, and I hate the kicking because having done various things and similarly like done things in feminism and then got absolutely kicked, you know, the crap out of me for them. I'm massively sympathetic to anyone who goes out there and actually does something rather than sitting on Twitter going, it looks like a Barbie. Um, and, and, I, and therefore I do, I'd like to add that I do feel bad about slagging off the statue. Now, I was going to ask you about the chapter on divorce, but I feel like now you've mentioned that kind of getting it, getting a, or did you just say getting the crap kicked out of you because something you've done for feminism? I feel like that's something we really need to talk, um, we really need to talk about, and then Carolina will come straight to you. Um, Is this the therapy session portion of the evening where we all kind of go, God, people can be very mean, can't they? Um, I, th I think, I think for all of us, it's just, just look at, looking at people that, you know, we all know banging the drum for feminism is is tricky and hard work and tiring and we had a really good session last week actually on resilient um activism which was was fantastic for those that were there but I don't know if it's something um something you want to reflect on just just kind of that constant that constant kicking that comes to feminism and in, and, and indeed anyone fighting for you know black lives matters or trans mm -hmm. rights or gay rights or whatever it is just just, just I think there's something you want to reflect on that experience and whether that was something you're able to sort of put into the book yeah, I mean, my 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 take on it, having been in these wars for you know nearly a decade, is that you have to you have to tune it out. Um, you need to do a process with yourself at the start of any campaign or any project, whatever it might be, writing project, where you think to yourself honestly, do, you know, does this need to be done? Am I the right person to do it? And is now the right time to do it? Square that with yourself. You know, have talk to people you really respect who would tell you if you know you'd missed something out. You know, you weren't you were overlooking stuff. Make sure that the people involved in the project are really good and representative and you you know you properly kick this around from intersectionally looking at other things and then you've just got to put the blinkers on and tune it out because they people weren't there when it was happening not everything can be perfect funds are constrained times are constrained you're the person in the room making the, the best decisions that you possibly can and you know people are massively entitled to have their own opinions on it and to express them in public equally where you don't I always say it with articles, you don't have to provide an after sale service. You're not selling people a car. You know, once the work goes out into the open, you you know, that's it. People can have their opinions on it, but you don't have to then go around to persuading their feelings to make them feel that they've been heard. And like when I used to um, edit a website, the website, um, the, Caroline who um, Crampton, who, who ran it on a day to day basis, said she'd read a thing about every new website, the complaints about it, every new website design always amounted to why wasn't I consulted? And like that is when you learn that that is what quite a lot of the criticisms are either I would have done this better or why wasn't I consulted, then it becomes quite a lot easier to deal with as does the recognition that there is no perfect way to do it and be without criticism right. I think as soon as you give up that delusion you're in a lot better place and as long as it's the right criticisms so there may very well be things that you you just missed and and if they're coming from a good faith pace that's the, that's the really that's the bit that I, I'd love to hear what and how anyone else deals with that is separating out the people who genuinely do want you to succeed and and say you know want to give you constructive input from the vast cacophony of people who don't give a crap one way or another whether you succeed or fail and they just want to say that they would have done it better yeah can I just add I just think that's that's really important what you were saying and it relates to you know a huge huge theme the theme of the book about being difficult and allowing yourself to um to be co not controversial but to divide opinion and not being scared about being having to be liked all the time and I think that's something as women we really deal you know we don't well not to put you know a label on all women but we don't deal with it well I know I personally don't I'm thinking you know what can go wrong you know what you know what can the fallout be and it's just really you know you can't live your life like that in my eyes and especially if you want to be a feminist campaigner or writer or activist or whatever you're gonna upset opinion and I think you know it's really something that we should be really taught how to deal with you know criticism um justified or not and how to just have that thick skin to deal with it really um, Car sorry Carolina you had a question Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, I just realized I blanked on a name that I remembered about two seconds ago and it'll come back to me at some point. I, I have a question that is not book related, but it is feminism related. So the so Biden's presenting his nominations for his cabinet and there's a lot of women, which is really great. Um, but the the last 
four years have so seen in the US is a prominent case, but it's happening around the world. Um, where you have a lot of women coming into prominence, but but like a lot of them are terrible, right? Like I have nothing in common with Amy Coney Barrett, and like I share none of her ideas. And I wonder what your thoughts are on the fact that we're 52% of the population. We are literally the majority on this planet. <laughs> there are more women <laughs> than there are men around. And I, I, I feel like the feminism sort of movement broadly is at a bit of a crossroads in having to move forward with now the conversation not being about just representation, at least in certain countries, but also about the fact that you shouldn't have to represent every woman like I I you know I I'm sure I could find things that I have in, in common with Amy Coney Barrett or you know what was Trump's special advisor whose name I always forget but I always use her as an example because she's odious like she's so terrible and, and so she's so easy to criticize um but just uh, this idea that that you have to sort of single-handedly represent women that you have absolutely nothing in common like I know no man that is fronted with that, right? Like I know black men are, are, and, you know, BAME friends are, are fronted with that, just sort of like, well, you know, mm. kind of similarities there, you know, same group. And it's like, it, that, that doesn't bear at all. And so so how do we move forward now that we're getting to a, to a stage, right? Where there are loads of female conservative MPs and loads of people that like have really different opinions are really prominent. And how do we relieve some of that pressure? Not not every woman has to be like us. We don't, we don't you know, we. I, I feel like we sort of need to revive the idea of sisterhood in a way that works because, you know, because we don't all have to be the same. We don't all have to be sisters and think the same way. Anyway, sorry, it's a big question. <laughs> it's a good, no, it's a good question. I just wanted, Carla, did you want to say yours as well in case they're related and then? They're not related. Okay, that's fine. I'll come back to you if that's all right then. Um, I mean, I think, you know, people have been getting very upset because um, Biden is talking about appointing a woman to be Secretary of Defence. And there's a kind of left wing thing of like, oh, I see. So it's much, you know, woker to get bombed by a woman, is it? And like, I just think that comes from a place of, of privilege, really. Like, mm. oh, you know, wh why would we get it? It's, it's, it's an absolute analogy to what people were saying. is Why should we give women the vote if they're going to vote Tory? That's what the Labour Party said in, in the early 1900s. They're only going to vote Tory, you know. And like it's you don't give women stuff based on what they're going to do with the opportunities. You give them the opportunities based on the fact that they're fifty percent and fifty two percent of the population. So you're right. Like the only way around that is to have enough women that it becomes unremarkable to be a woman. That it's Trump has a councillor of either gender, and I don't agree with what they're saying, and and that's fine. And 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 Supreme Court justices, you know, again, it should be the case that there are some conservative justices you don't who you don't agree with, and it. And it's unremarkable enough that one of them is a woman that you're not expected to purely cheer her on because of that. Until we get to that stage, then yeah, it's always going to be a moment where I'm I'm happy that you know that the right has also seen the need to appoint a woman to the Supreme Court. I'm unhappy about the fact that it, it can be very often tokenized that they can say like, look, we've got a woman. Like, look, you know, how how can anyone say that this is an anti-feminist policy when we've got a woman saying it? And and that doesn't make me happy. But the, again. What is the, the effect of that is just that it's normalizing the idea of women being appointed to the Supreme Court. So that next time a, a, a left wing woman is put forward, the confirmation hearings won't focus so much on, oh, could you balance this job with having a child? You know, what if the fact that she's had contraceptive access makes her emotional about this? You know, it's, it's, it's wearing down those, those barriers. And I think it's, you know, I don't like what lots of people who are elected into offices, lots of people at the top of business, any of those kind of things are doing with their power. But that doesn't mean that we should only let men have that power. Mm. And that's a bit where I just, that's a bit where I just find it, that argument just gets very confused. Okay, so fine. I'm not going to go out and campaign to have, you know, a woman leading the Pentagon. I've got other things on, but it should be, it obviously should be in a job to which there is equal opportunities and equal access. Carla? First of all, um, it's really lovely to meet you because you've been talking to me for about three weeks uh, because I, I'm a fan of Oh, audio. am I in your audio? But I was so I've following, been listening to you for you about three weeks every day, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's nice to hear you say other words and kind of free speech style. Um, <laughs> and, and I, well, first of all, um, thank you so much for bringing the concept of unpaid labour, although I've read the um, the 
your friend's book about data who's Caroline, Caroline Perez, yeah yeah uh, and so now in my house we have a uh, a whiteboard where we put the unpaid labor on the board to see that we're splitting the unpaid labor in the house um in a, in a nice way so thanks for bringing that back in um and i think when it comes to one of the things that overwhelming things that struck me about the book was and, and this is something i'm particularly struggling with within my own political life at the moment is this idea of um the radical and the not so radical having to come together to, to like put your differences aside you said something so poignant at the end which was like um, don't throw all your lot in with somebody that just agrees with you on one particular thing, but is completely opposite on 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 virtually everything else. And and I think that that slow progression and and how we progress is that the, the the marriage of the radical and 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 the the kind of the people who are willing to sit down and and write the legislation and and have the words and try and persuade people on on a daily level because unless you persuade the people that are currently in power, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, so I don't know if I've got a question. I, I just wanted to say- I, No, it's, it's yeah. a really, because you're right, because actually I think that's one of the hardest things. And again, it should be part of that process that you do at the start of um, any kind of campaign is, is look at who you are willing to ally with. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes you can find uh, points of, of overlap and, and, the, and, and that's okay. Yeah, my, 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 for me, the limit is, allying with people who who would you know who I mean I'm, I was really in that case talking about um the religious right in America yeah. um and and the fact you just don't have anything in common with people who don't believe that there should be abortion rights you know you that's just it's not worth getting into bed with those people not least because you'll discredit yourself forever mm -hmm. but equally well you can't be super hygienic about stuff I um, interviewed Simon Fanshawe as one of the original founders of Stonewall and he was so interesting on this you know they went out and they talked to the church you know they went out and they talked to military leaders at that time you know, gay people weren't allowed to serve in the army and they made the arguments that they thought would most appeal um, to them. So when they went to religious leaders for example they said okay so you, we know that you've got biblical problems with homosexuality but isn't there a free speech issue here that, you know, if you're talking about minority rights, the same things that are being used to, you know, say that you can't talk about homosexuality in schools could be one day used by government to say, actually, do we really want to have faith schools? We want to talk about religion in schools. So we've got this point of, of agreement that there's a principle that we can both, you know, that we can both defer to. And actually, weirdly, there's a kind of similar case with the Supreme Court in the US, actually, about closing churches when you're not closing restaurants. And Brett Stevens wrote a quite convincing column in the New York Times yesterday saying, you know, the fact is you might not think that, you know, if you're a sort of liberal atheist American, you might not think that churches are that important, but this is, you know, this is an, a defense of a minority, essentially, saying that they, you know, shouldn't be treated any different to anyone else. And if you allow, if you, if you decide that Christians don't deserve protection, don't be surprised when next, you know, next time it's LGBT people, this is, you know, this is the point, is the, even minorities you're not part of, whose existence you don't really, you know, um, support in the same way as you would progressive causes, they're still minorities. This is what like the point of democracy and liberalism and free speech is. And this is why we have the, you know, the argument so much in, in this kind of deplatforming and cancellation stuff is if you really, really do you want to open the box of only people who agree with me um, get to speak because that can be used against you. And probably let's be honest with you with a predominantly right wing press will be used against you if that becomes a generally accepted uh, you know weapon that you can pick up I, I do have a question which I, I forgot just briefly and um, which is did you touch upon the fact that um did you touch upon stability at any point Not because really. um I was I was thinking about all these different women and how much easier it is to not only when you have time but when you have something stable so when you're on a constantly moving platform, when you're the most vulnerable, it is very hard to have to assert your rights or to try and change anything. And and I don't know. It kind of seems, and from a point of stability, where you can where you can change things, either if that's having a network or or relying with other women um, or, or people that are willing to support you. But if you're coming from a, a moving platform, and it seems people who are coming from instability are maybe the people that could do with raising up the most. 
Um, oh, I think it's a, I think it's the up. major problem for like campaigns for workers' rights in the 21st century is that people are not staying in the same job their whole life. You know, they're not working in a factory where you see the same people every day and, and union organizing becomes relatively straightforward. You know, they're working in an Amazon. The people who most need, you know, what, what tra a good trade union can do are working and you know in in an in an amazon warehouse where they report to an app on their wrist you know and they don't they don't really talk to other people you know or they're working for uber and they're in their own car and they're you know and that they're very rarely you know or, or you know black cab drivers have sort of cafes that they all go to and they talk about stuff and they share information that's not that fragmented world of work has, has broken that all up and it's made it much harder and that's always the problem that women have always had is you know if their um contact with the labor force is unstable um, you know, if they're working part time, uh, then, you know, it was it was so revelatory to me, the fact that the one of the things that made the most difference for the suffragettes was the fact that you, because of the legacy of the Married Women's Property Act, you have women who have their own money. And because of that, they have union organizers working for the Women's Social Political Union who do it full time. No. And for the first time, you have women who don't have children who do it in the, you know, in the, in the time before they get organized. And that's the story of the 20th century of the successes of feminism, right? It's the fact that the pill gave us years in which we could do stuff before we had kids and gave us the ability to control the number of kids that we had. And it's the fact that the dishwasher and the washing machine gave us back hours and hours and hours a week that we would have otherwise spent with a mangle. And that's what worries me slightly is I, I always wonder how much of the moment's progress is, is technologically driven and how much of it is about stuff that we took off men because it's always going to be easier to get the labor saving device than it is to get the equal parity at work. Care robots. Hmm. Emma, are you trying to say something? Yeah, just quickly. Um, I was completely struck by that argument when I was reading the book and my mum always said that the um, greatest invention, you know, forget everything else was the contraceptive pill for the impact it's had on so many women's lives I mean she was a massive you know like feminist she is a massive feminist and all that so she would say that but I I meant in in sort of like looking forward how do you sort of a massive problem I sort of see is the unpaid care burden and we've already touched upon this and the time that women take on without you know a completely thankless task completely you know assumed task and I just really worry for that next the, those next campaigns and the women of today who still have to deal with you know the unpaid labor. and how do you sort of anticipate that we're going to get through that problem and that's the next thing that's going to be sort of tackled because I just it's insurmountable it's really quite you know frustrating to see these incredible women spending so much time on on gendered gendered duties mm, and I think they're two halves of the same thing as well I think that the instruction and the kind of social conditioning not to be difficult is in order to fit you to be the workforce that picks up all the slack right that if everything else goes wrong oh you know mum will sort it out granny will sort it out and I think that those two things are kind of inextricable um but the thing that kind of gives me a slight amount of hope is that the men I know of my generation are much more into, they, they see fatherhood as a much more integrated part of their lives than I think my dad's generation would have done. You know, I think people are having, you know, and not just kind of people from highly educated backgrounds, people are having less of an assumption that, you know, I mean, this, I was reading the second shift, which I mentioned in the book, you know, the assumption in the 70s is that, you, you know, well, one of you stays at home with the kids. Well, that just that is not the assumption anymore. I think in any, anywhere across the socioeconomic scale. And that does change things. But yeah, I agree with you. I'm very worried about the, uh, um, the crisis of elderly care, particularly, because I think you end up with these women in these crunched lives where, you know, you're, uh, they you, you take some time out of the workforce to care for children and just when things can be picking back up again you take more time off to care for your elderly parents and that has really big consequences particularly for women who get divorced in later life um because you can end up in, in poverty really really easily and and unfortunately to me i mean no, fortunately or unfortunately the, the solution is a left-wing one the only people who can act as an, an insurance policy in that kind of case is the state to my mind uh, and therefore it has to be paid like the NHS, it has to be paid out of some sort of general taxation where you can essentially spread bet the risk across everybody. Asking people to come up with their own individual solutions as we do now is leading to some incredible inequalities. Um, but it will be a very um, brave government as per the 2017 election that wades into that debate because it's, it's, you know, and, the, and I just feel like the only way forward really is some sort of cross party commission. Um, but given that all the other things on this government's plate, don't really think that's one they're going to get around to. 
Yeah, hopefully maybe with COVID and I don't know, some reflections from the, the way that care has sort of been distributed during the pandemic. I don't know, maybe that's somewhere that we can be hopeful, but I just sort of look to the future and I sort of think there aren't these, I mean, there's there's, organ, there's women's organizations having these discussions. The Women's Budget Group has a you know huge amount of work on the care economy and things like that, but I just don't see it happening at the top level of politics. And it makes me so angry because it's something that affects you know, most women and it just, oh. Here's the unanswerable question, which I'd I, I would love to hear anyone else's answers to. How do you get men to do traditionally female jobs? That's the one that we just, no one knows how to crack because in the same way that you can make women wear trousers, but apart from wonderful Harry Styles, it's very rare for men to wear skirts, right? Women will always want to trade up. There's a lot of, you know, social advantage to doing that. And actually working in a male dominated industry for all the discrimination that you might face, there's advantages to it where you know how do we get men doing nvqs in being nail technicians how do we get men working in care homes how do we get men working as primary school teachers you know that's the bit we always talk about women in stem and women ceos and all that stuff where's the bit where we talk about how important it is for young boys to see men in caring roles mm. and like men don't want to have that conversation i mean if or if men do want to have that conversation i'm not hearing it or there's no space for it and I don't know what, I also fundamentally don't think it can be a conversation really that can be led by women. I think it has to be a conversation that's led by my men. And I think that feminism has always got to this stage where you're like, when did we become the sort of, you know, like women, when you get that sort of MRA kickback on stuff and it can, when we've got our movement that's for us, that you need to do this movement for you. Like I can't lead your movement for you. I would say the reason that the, those jobs are not, are not done by men is because they tend to be, all jobs that are traditionally done, by women are the worst paid jobs or care okay. work, work or, or every everything you can think of that is traditionally done by a woman is less paid than a sort of equivalent job like being a police officer and being a nurse is a big but nurses train for three years and police train for is it 12 weeks or something but it happens both ways right so if you get women move into a field then the wages in that field fall which happens like computer pro um yeah and, and vice versa when men move into a field the wages got which happened with computer programmers um, and the, the opposite example of it is teachers, right? When you move from the kind of Mr. Chips headmaster, it's a very prestigious job or GPs actually. And then, you know, then it becomes a, from being a kind of stern dispenser of authority, GP now becomes a sort of soothing, caring profession. And that's about the sort of stereotypes that we impose on it. So actually just, if you could get more men into those professions in the same way that the whole premise of say, comprehensive schooling or mixed housing is that if you have some people with sharp elbows alongside some people with less sharp elbows, then it raises everybody up together, right? That, that was the whole point of something like Teach First was to say, we're gonna raise the status of teaching as a profession. Um, and similarly, that would be the effect of if you could get more men into caring work, is that they'd be like, well, this is terrible. Have you seen how badly these people are paid? You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and people might actually, it become, might become a much more salient issue. But as you say, the problem is the assumption still, still baked in that women's wages are secondary. They're not the breadwinners in the house. So they don't really need to be paid that much. Mm. I think. Go on, go on, go on. Yeah, if we, if we increase the wages and the status of sort of caring um, or, yeah, roles that are seen as caring um, orientated roles, then that would be that would be good for the women who are already in them and it would attract more men to them so I think the focus should be on sort of elevating those caring professions and then that would probably follow that sort of more men would be drawn towards them um, and but even if it didn't it would just improve the sort of quality of life and the respect for the kind of women who are doing what is the most essential work. Definitely there is a, a central like central to all of this discussion I think it's a completely a complete undervaluing of women's work or mm. doing work and that is you know dissipates into the pay and the regard it, it sort of takes and it's just it's really frustrating I think. Mm. Is there yeah. any societies in the world where the caring profession does or, or, or caring is equally distributed that hasn't been kind of encouraged by law? like anywhere no, no and I don't know how I don't know how it would happen by law just simply down to kind of biology right is that it all flows from um you know childbirth and breastfeeding but um there's a brilliant in in Rutger Bregman's Humankind for example there's a really brilliant story of a Dutch guy who was an economist who quit to become a, uh, to run a care service and what he does it's much more autonomous instead of the kind of current outsource model where you get people paid you know whatever it is per visit 
and they're kind of used like an assembly line. He pioneered a, a care service where they got paid in block bulk, you know, certain amount per patient. And it was then up to them to organize their own services. And that's another part of the picture to me, like that job becomes much more interesting and much more autonomous and actually much more satisfying than if you're there trying to do 15 minute visits and you're like, you're, you're working in this productive way that is actually very, you know, like a Fordist production line, which just doesn't work when you're working with people. And actually, I think there's a, there's something to be done about the fact that the whole way we structured that, because it's done in this way that is very metrics based, makes those jobs kind of really hard and unfulfilling. And you could probably attract if you you could probably attract more men to them if they were more autonomous and therefore they seemed you know swankier. The thing I want to ask about from the book, um, because we haven't got much time left now, so I hope everyone reminds me butting in, is divorce. Now I know I felt like the divorce chapter had such a profound effect on me because I don't know how I've missed this my whole life that divorce is such a feminist. Kind of, you know it's such a breakthrough in 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 the fight for women when when divorce you know come comes along and I guess just because of the very nature of divorce that is such a traumatic thing it's not something we really celebrate like we don't have a kind of you know we don't celebrate the day when divorce first came in or any of the kind of divorce milestones like we do other you know things to do with voting and so on and and, and in hindsight I kind of feel like that's a bit of a mistake because like Emily said about the pill like life changes when the pill comes along D divorce and, and property all well, the property rights that came after divorce and so on are like a, 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 a magnificent in kind of kind of the, the change they they bring about for women and it's, it's I feel really stupid now that I've never sat down and really thought about it in those in those kind of terms as divorce is the great liberator but um now I absolutely kind of think it's something we need to to talk about a lot a lot more I don't know if anyone else has got any thoughts Well, I will say, you know, it was, it was, I knew I wanted it to first be the first chapter because it's, it's one of those, what I think of as unfashionable rights. Um, and and, and a, a category I would also place abortion rights into, um, you know, it is a measure that, you know, it's a measure of the success of feminist campaigning that you like, that we have managed to win something that is not a kind of hooray celebratory, mm. you know, you can't, like you say, you can't have an awareness day of it. Like no company is going to be able to, you know, get kind of corporate points for celebrating it it's it's kind of gritty and unpleasant and and it's about economic fairness and that's and therefore the victory is all the more impressive I would I would say and I'm, I'm I think no fault divorce will be fantastic I'm so happy that it's gone through simply because I think you know um actually divorce rates have been going down I mean marriage rates are, are going down too people are getting married later generally um but you know we've 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 remade our idea of what marriage is within a century really which is kind of astonishing and if if a, you know if a, if a if a marriage is over what is the point then of all the stuff that I talk about in my book about you know the fact that you then have to start getting into a bung fight about who did what and who was worse and and like in any kind of relationship that's already sort of faintly toxic that's just going to pour petrol all over it and I don't know, you know, this, this situation in which women have to be begging for money off someone that they also have to prove has been a bastard to them. It's just so unbelievably, you know, that you couldn't design a system more likely to just wind up people and, and exaggerate the differences between them. So I've got, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously the implementation is obviously everything and the family courts are in a pretty grim state because of austerity. But I, I, I do think that is a it's so weird because it hasn't become a big become a big culture war thing like abortion this you know this reform just passed completely unnoticed I think I was about one of the only people who wrote a column about it this summer but it was such a massive deal and it mm. really annoyed me actually but it was I think a good lesson for campaigners you don't have to turn everything into a we're incredibly virtuous and the other side of bastards to win it actually you can win really significant feminist victories by just building a sort of boring big middle ground consensus of people there's still stuff to do like that and I think this is always a thing that you know I think campaigners kind of get addicted to is the idea that if people are against them actually that sort of proves that they, they're winning you know that they're, they're on the right side and I, you have to ask yourself you know, do you want to be right or do you want to be successful um, and that's a big lesson I think for campaigners too 
On um, on no fault of force, um, I I I'm sort of um, automatically. I think it's a good idea, and I'm in favour of um, it as just much more straightforward. And I think a right people should have. But I spoke um, to a divorced relative about it, who was really who wasn't keen on it because she said that so many marriages that end in divorce, it's because there's been some sort of abuse that maybe you know wouldn't be legally or criminally recognized but there's been a level of like abusive behavior often from the man towards a woman in that marriage and she found it incredibly validating that she was able to get sort of that the divorce had to be on the grounds of yes like your husband's behaved unreasonably and she sort of thought if it had just been no fault she wouldn't have got that same sense of sort of release from it and um I just wondered kind of what what you thought about that um well, lots of people's unreasonable, um, the grounds of um, unreasonable behaviour, lots of people essentially just make it up. You have mm. to kind of come up with a list. And then you get, you get the weird possibility, which happened in the um, Tiny Owens case, that they, the court can then go, well, this doesn't seem very unreasonable. I think you guys can probably work it out, which is not a, <laughs> you know, not a situation that you want yeah. to be in. And again, I think it is, it is sort of that thing about, do you want to be right or do you want to win? Actually, mm. what's better is, it, is it better for a lot of women to be able to get in writing with no legal follow-on that, 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 that someone's been a complete dick to them? Or is it better that a lot of women, and you're talking about abusive relationships, a lot of women manage to get a divorce where they don't poke the bear of someone who mm. is incredibly defensive, who then you know takes the kids away on a, um, on a custody visit and doesn't return them at the appropriate time, just holding that over her you know, of, of not paying the child support on time to prove that he's got that power because he, you know, he wants to. You should make divorce as amicable as possible. Mm. It, particularly if you're of the view as I am that it, it, you know we are still almost always going into it that as a situation as a woman uh, with a woman as a junior economic partner mm. so I would say that unfortunately your relative's sense of validation to me is a lesser good than not you know unduly provoking abusive men to further acts of, of abuse which is what I think the current system does it's I know, but I mean it, it comes into a different category about whether or not oh you know are we are we prosecuting domestic abuse strongly enough? You know, are we, and, and we're not obviously because the police resources are just simply not there. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense sort of separating it out as an issue. Like that shouldn't be the only form of validation right. you can get for what you've suffered. It, yeah, that shouldn't be the arena in which you have to be kind of looking for that judgment. Mm. Yeah. That should be more recourse for that person. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm. Just looking at your book, I know we've only got five minutes left. Um, looking at all the chapters you've got here, we've got divorce, the vote, sex, play, work, safety, love, education, time and abortion. What do you anticipate for the future? What chapter do you think, if you were writing the book now, um, what big campaign win do you see on the horizon or what would you fancy writing about? I mean, I think that rebuilding the economy um, post-COVID has got to be done and I doubt will be done it, with, it, with proper gender analysis cooked into it from the start. You know, I also think all the time about the fact that all the, when people start going back to work, who is it who's going back to work? And what conversations are happening between the people who go back to work? And I could foresee this situation, particularly if schools keep intermittently closing for the next couple of months and you, your kid might have to suddenly self-isolate. But what happens is a load of senior male managers go back to work and suddenly that's the clique, you know, that's the new kind of golf club or networking where the big boys hang out and women find themselves excluded once again. So that was that was one of my really big worries. And, and baking that kind of analysis into stuff, I think, is is really important. Um, I think, yeah, I think care is the big one um, and, and it will always be the big one. But um, and I and I also think that domestic violence this year has been particularly acute. Um, lots of people getting locked down you know, in this toxic combination of being bored and lonely, drinking too much, money worries, you know. Um, so Nicola Sturgeon had this lovely idea of giving £500 to um, every uh, NHS worker in Scotland, but because so many of them are on universal credit, a huge amount of that's going to get eaten up um, in, 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 in universal credit clawbacks. And I don't think there's quite an awareness of, you know, the, the, the still functionally universal credit to me is just a terribly designed system, terribly implemented. And cleaning that up should be a huge feminist priority because it's 
you know, it's something that was warned about all the way through payments ahead mm -hmm. of household were, 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 were terrible and anti-feminist and went against everything that we've campaigned for for 50 years in terms of women's economic independence. And then stuff like, you know, getting these um, forward payments that you then have to pay back. It, that's you know that's 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 extraordinary to me that the level that pe people are, are debt going into and you know when you talk about something like free school meals and the number of children who are going hungry during half term quite often that will also be mothers who are going hungry as well right mothers who are, are skipping meals in order that, that their children can have one um and because they're not that's not quite as photogenic that's sort of being left out of that conversation but for every hungry child i doubt that there is a, a, a very well-fed adult in that household either um, and nine out of 10 single parents are, are, are mothers. So that, you know, that, that, there's a lot of what I call bread and butter feminism that needs to be done in the next couple of years. And it won't happen on social media. Like it won't happen in columns written by people like me. It will happen via grassroots organizations and by the steady, you know, chip, chip, chip of legislation, judicial reviews, and, and that kind of campaigning. I couldn't agree more. Um, very quickly before we finish, um, you mentioned your new book that you're writing. Would you just want to plug it for a minute? <laughs> Sorry, I haven't written very much of it yet. Um, so I decided I wanted to write about um, exceptional achievement, about geniuses. Uh, and one of my ways into this was, it's not going to be a, a primarily a feminist book, although there will be a feminist angle to it. It's about the kind of, I'm, I'm so in love with that Elizabeth Warren line, you know, you, you got rich, like, well done to you, keep a big chunk of it, but no one gets rich on their own. You took your goods to market on roads that we all built. You know, you got to, you didn't get burgled because of a police service that we all paid for. If your house burns down, like the fire service will come that we all paid for. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. Actually, also in terms of exceptional achievement, we lionize geniuses and we try and therefore invisibly tidy away the huge support crew that's around them. Whether or not that's something as simple as growing up in a home where you get food or getting a childhood vaccination or whether it's you get to go to a university you get to be a member of a society a professional society all of those things that subtly keep building people up so they can reach the top of the pyramid and I want to talk about the whole rest of the pyramid because that's you know that's that's the interesting bit and that's the bit that kind of gets forgotten in this rush to talk about these usually men who have achieved exceptional things. Definitely. Well, I can't wait. Is there a is there an estimated date as to when that will be available? Summer 2022. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's good. Well, we'll keep an eye out for it. Thank you so okay. much for your time tonight. Um, I absolutely loved the book. I I devoured it in about two days. I absolutely loved it, and I spent every lunch break reading it. So thank you so much for sort of giving all the information of all the different issues that I'm passionate about in one place. It was absolutely fantastic. Well, if you do love it, please do leave a review on Amazon because some bugger has been on there and left a two star review really? because it arrived with a damaged cover oh, and nuked my <laughs> nuked my review score. So, yeah. So Amazon and Goodreads reviews. Very okay. much welcome. <laughs> very, no, very much noted. Yeah. So our next. Um, so Kelly's posted in the chat. Our next book is Feminist City by Leslie Kern. And it's the first day. It's the first Wednesday of every uh, every month so please do um, buy the book read it and join us next time tomorrow we have an event on Barbara Castle with Angela Eagle, Naz Shah, Kate Hullen and Rachel Reeves which me and Kelly are leading so please do get in touch if you want the link to that it should be a really really good night of just celebrating the Labour legend. If you wanted to sign up now while you're thinking of it. Sorry? on our twitter feed as well if anyone wants okay, to perfect perfect um but again thank you helen and thanks everyone else for joining this thanks season. helen it's been brilliant yeah, thank you so much Good. really thank enjoyed you your much. book everyone look forward to barbara castle tomorrow <laughs> yeah, she's you. my hero <laughs> yeah. See you later, thanks a lot bye -bye. Bye. thanks emily for everyone. organizing it thank cheers bye-bye